Hello and welcome to this tutorial on the extended access list. Now the extended access list is a lot more complex than the standard access list, but it's also a lot more powerful. And the reason why that is, is simply because we can match more parts of the packet. So you can really fine tune what you're filtering with an extended access list. So this means you're going to have to know more about the IP packet and we've covered some of that detail in the ICND1 materials along with TCP and UDP and you're going to see how they come up in this tutorial again so if you need a refresher be sure to go ahead and check those videos out. Here we have the structure of the extended access list and you can see it's a lot bigger than your standard access list so let's go through the different parts. We start off with the same command, access list, and then we have to specify a number. However, this time, the ranges that we can choose from are different. For an extended access list, the numbers can be between 100 and 199, or 2000 and 2699. Okay, so you can choose from either of those two ranges. And then again, we have the permit and the deny statements. Nothing new there. So, so far, this is looking pretty much like the standard access list, except for the access list number ranges. And then we get into our first new um, parameter. And this is the protocol. And here, we, can, we have to specify a particular protocol. And this can be IP, this can be TCP, it could be UDP or ICMP. There are several more as well. Remember, when you state a protocol, you could be talking about IP or you could be talking about something on a higher level of the OSI model, like TCP or UDP, which are both within an IP packet. So think about the OSI model and how um, data is encapsulated and it works its way up and down the OSI model stack. Keep that in mind and refer to those tutorials as well if you're ever confused about the protocols that we'll be talking about here. Okay, so we have to specify a protocol. After that, we move back into familiar territory. We have to state a source, and then, of course, we can fine-tune that source with a wildcard mask. So that's pretty much the same as a standard access list as well. And then we move back into something new. Here we have operator and port. So what we can do is we are allowed to specify a port which will identify an application on the source. Now this applies to TCP and UDP, but not to IP. Um, IP does not, you cannot uh, specify port numbers for IP, but for the transport protocols you can. So for example, TCP port 23 is the dedicated port for a Telnet, and TCP port 22 is the dedicated port for SSH. So we can specify ports now from both the source, and as you'll see in a minute, the destination as well. So when I said we can really fine-tune what we want to filter, I really did mean that. Now that's the port portion of this. The operator simply means do we want to equal this port number? Do we want to not equal it? Are we talking about less than or greater than? And we can even specify a range. So that operator is a mathematical operator and it lets you specify um, you know, details about that port that you're interested in. So after that, then we move into the destination. So the source, the source's wildcard mask, and the operator and port all have to deal with the source of the IP packet. And then we simply repeat all of that, but now we do it for the destination. So we can specify a destination IP, we can fine tune it again with a wildcard mask, and then once again we can specify an operator in a port. And then finally, after this, we can, we, it's an optional command, we can say established. And that simply means that uh, devices on the inside of an access list can go ahead and establish a session to someone on the outside, and that return traffic will be allowed to come back in. However, people on the outside of the access list will not be able to establish a session to somebody behind the access list on the inside. And then finally we can say if we want to log every time a packet matches a particular statement, we can do that. And then we'll get a message in the router log uh, with some additional information, which can be very useful for troubleshooting. Okay, so this is the overall structure. We're going to run through a few examples to really flush this out. 
A few notes though before we get into the examples. Every field that you specify on an access list, an extended access list, every field must match in order for the action to be applied. Okay, so a permit or a deny will not happen unless everything you specify here matches the packet. Now, just like a standard access list, we apply an, an extended access list using the IP access group command, and we also use the parameter in or out. So we affect uh, a direction of traffic, either inbound or outbound. So that all remains the same. However, this time, the rule of thumb is, the suggestion when you configure these, is to place the extended access list as close to the source as possible. Remember for the standard we said to put it as close to the destination? Well this time it's on the other side, closest to the source. Now another similarity with the standard access list is that you cannot in, uh, delete individual lines of an extended access list. So again, you're either deleting everything or you're deleting nothing. All right, so let's take a look at a few examples. Okay, our first example, access list 110. So we're in the correct range for access list numbers for extended ACLs. And we're going to permit any packet that matches this statement. The protocol we're interested in is TCP. And here's our source, 192.168.1.0. And we fine tune that with a wildcard mask. And then we're going to go ahead and not specify an operator or a port for the source. Why? Because that's optional. You don't have to put a port there for your source traffic. Since we haven't, let's move on. Now let's look at the destination. Do you remember in the standard access list we talked about the host, com the host parameter and the any parameter? Well you can use them for extended access lists as well. So here we're identifying a single host, 172.16.10.1. There's no need for a wildcard mask since we're using the host parameter. And then we use our operator. Here we're interested in, in matching exactly the port that's going to follow it, port number 22. So this entire statement reads, match any TCP packet from this subnet going to this host on port number 22 for TCP. Let's take a look at another example. We're using access list 110 again, and this time we're going to permit, and we're going to specify again TCP, and we have a subnet as well, a source and a wildcard mask. Notice again we did not specify an operator or a port number for the source traffic, and all that means is we're not identifying a particular port that the packet has to come from on the on the source. We're only identifying the IPs that the packet has to be sourced from. Okay, and then again, we go ahead and we put the host parameter along with a single IP. And this time again, we're going to equal a single port. You can see we don't have a port number there. Now we have a word. Well, for the very popular ports like uh, port 80 or port 23 or 22, and there are several more, you can use the, um, the text name for that port for the well-known ones. So don't be surprised when you see Telnet. You could put port 23 on there if you wanted to, or you could type out Telnet when you're actually configuring this. Okay, access list 110. In this example, we're again cho choosing TCP. And this time we're only identifying a single host to source traffic. But this time we're now choosing a source port, which means we are interested in any TCP traffic from IP address 192.168.1.0, which comes from port 5001. And it's going to be destined for a single host 172, 16, 10.1, and not only for that, not only destined for that single host, but destined for exactly port number 6001 on that destination IP. Okay, so that's how the entire access list would read. You can also do something like this. This statement is pretty much the exact same as the last one, 
But notice at the end here, our operator has changed. This time we're not equaling a single port, we've stated a range of ports. So perhaps our host here, the 172.16.10.1 IP, perhaps it has an application running, and that application is listening on those ports for TCP. And we want to go ahead and permit our source, 192.168.1.0, to access those ports using TCP only if they're sourced from port 5001 on the source. Okay? Here we're going to apply one of the examples to an actual working environment. So we're going to configure an access list on this router and we'll go ahead and, uh, and filter traffic coming from the source PC destined to the file server 192.168.10.1. Okay, let's begin our access list with a remark. And we can use these for extended access lists as well as standard. And this is just going to help us remember why we configured this in the first place many months from now when we look at it again. Our first line is going to look like this. Access list 115, where we are going to deny any TCP traffic which is sourced from our PC 10.10.10.17, which is destined for the web server on TCP port 80. Okay, so port 80 is the common port for uh, web traffic. So we could have also put here the text equivalent, which would have been www. Either one would work. So here we're just basically blocking that PC from accessing the web server. Our next line is going to affect the entire subnet that the PC lives on. So here we're going to deny any TCP traffic which is generated from this entire slash 24 and it's destined for the file server and it's particularly concerned with this range ports 10,000 through 12,000. Okay, so any traffic from that subnet TCP traffic destined for the file server but specifically ports 10,000 through 12,000 using TCP will be denied. We'll end the access list with the permit IP any any. Now remember the extended access list also has the implicit deny at the end just like the standard access list. So if we did not put this everything else would be implicitly or automatically denied. And here we're specifying IP. So we're not just specifying one of uh, the transport protocols like TCP or UDP. We're taking a step lower in the OSI model to include both of those. So it's a little bit of a wider net here, any IP packet. When we go to apply this, it's going to be the exact same method as we use to apply a standard access list. We have to go into the interface. So this is a uh, interface uh, subcommand and we use the IP access group, we specify the number, and then the direction. And here we are, we are applying this to inbound traffic. So going back to our diagram, here is uh, the access list that we configured. And the, the general rule is to apply an extended access list close to the source. So we would be applying this on FA00 using the IP access group command and we're specifying inbound so anything generated from this PC or anyone else on this subnet is going to be affected and again that traffic will be examined before it gets to the routing stage on that router okay Okay, so to summarize the extended access lists, we have the structure here, and be sure that you're familiar with all of the different parts and why they're in there and what they do. We mentioned that the any and the host parameters can also be used instead of a destination or a wildcard mask, just like the standard access lists. Also, every field must be matched. Now, some of the fields are, are optional, like the ports. However, if you add them, it must be matched in order for the action, permit or deny, to be affected. We apply extended access list the same way using the IP access group command. And as a general rule of thumb, we want to apply the access list close to the source. 
Just like the standard access list, we cannot delete individual access list statements. You, you either delete the entire thing or you leave it alone. And then finally, a command you might want to check out is the show IP interface command. This command will tell you a lot of information, but specifically for access lists, it will tell you what access lists are currently applied to that interface. So it's pretty helpful to identify what's configured on that interface. Okay, so that's it. That is the extended access list. Thanks for watching.